When you think about this pandemic, it's hard. We've been doing this a long time, but you have to keep yourselves, your family, and our patients safe. It's what we do. We take care of sick people when they need us. No matter where we are in the world right now, meeting our public health and medical challenges requires innovative and thoughtful public policy solutions. The most effective proposals are those that rely on a multidisciplinary approach fueled by reason, creativity, and evidence-based problem solving. Here, in the Hopkins Health Policy Forum, we'll meet leaders from all levels of government who design or implement health policies and address our most pressing problems. At a pivotal point in the pandemic, with millions of Americans seeking the COVID vaccine, Dr. Rochelle Walensky is focused on vaccine delivery and strategies to reach underserved communities. I am honored by the trust you have placed in me to serve the American people during this critical time. The former chief of the Division of Infectious Disease at Massachusetts General Hospital, now selected by President Biden as the 19th director of the CDC. We've been through a lot this past year and with more and more people getting vaccinated each day, we are starting to turn a corner. Walensky served on the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic and is an expert on the testing, prevention, and treatment of infectious disease. We have a nation to vaccinate against COVID-19, and it will take all of us working together to achieve this monumental task. Better, healthier days lie ahead, says Walensky, which is wonderful news to a nation eager to get back to normal. I promise to work with you to harness the power of American science, to fight this virus and prevent unnecessary illness and deaths so that we can all get back to our lives. Good morning. My name is Paul Rothman. I'm the Dean CEO of Johns Hopkins Medicine. And I am so pleased today to be the host for our discussion with Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Walensky is very well known to us here in the Johns Hopkins community. She grew up in Maryland and she began her career here as a student in the School of Medicine and then trained here at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And she's a dear friend and advisor for many folk, people here, both in the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine. So she's one of her own and in many ways. And we're so glad she's with us today. You know, Michelle is a pioneering scientist, an influential scholar, and a talented clinician who has served on the front line uh, during this pandemic. She spent a career putting science into action and taking the most pressing health challenges and tackling them for us and for the country. At a moment when the pandemic is still raging in this country, I can think of no person better equipped to lead the agency that is the tip of the spear for our COVID response. We are so proud of her and so lucky to have her at the CDC. Our conversation today promises to be wide ranging and stimulating and please join me in welcoming Dr. Walensky back to Johns Hopkins University. Thank you so much, Dr. Rothman. I'm so delighted to be here, um, to be back home with Johns Hopkins. <laughs> So I have to ask, why did you choose to take this job on? <laughs> um, you know, I, I didn't apply for this job. Um, I got a phone call asking me to, to take it. Um, and um, I, I wasn't exactly sure where or why it came, um, but I wasn't feeling like I was in a position to say no. I mean, I was trained by you all um, in medicine and in residency. And um, you, I, I think I said this in my nomination speech, you know, when, when the code paper goes off, you run. That's what you all trained us to do. And so somebody was calling and there was a code, the country needed help. And so uh, the answer wasn't, you know, to not answer. <laughs> and so um, I, it wasn't, I, I, I knew it was a hard job. I knew it was going to be, I, I called it my mid-career residency <laughs> is what I called it. I knew it was going to be 24 um, seven uh, for uh, several years, however long uh, this, this uh, you know, the position will last for me and I hope it'll be a long time. Um, but I didn't feel like I was in a position that I could say no when somebody called needing help. Well, um, I hope we train you well in terms of 24 seven. I know we train you well in that aspect. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, so. indeed. So tell me, what's it like to be the CDC director during a pandemic? Um, 
You know, what I really, it, it's a lot. There's no question it's a lot. There's um, not everybody in the country before now had even heard of the CDC. So we are in the spotlight all of the time. Our guidance is in the spotlight. What we do, what we recommend is, is um, you know, I, we, we've had so many thousands of, of um, uh, guidances that have been put out, MMWRs that have been put out, um, phone calls that we've taken in, media requests that we've taken in. It's truly extraordinary. Um, and what I need to do is just like have that occur, but have it kind of occur in the periphery and just make sure that the work that we are doing is following the signs, leading the public in the right direction through this pandemic. And that's what I've been trying to do. Um, focus on what really matters. And that is making sure that the guidance is the right guidance for the public. So, you know, a lot of the decisions you make are very complex. And we're, you know, and as physicians, we train on making decisions on incomplete data. And, and, and that I think we all, we resonate with us. We do that with patients all the time. But here you have so many more complexities than just what is exactly the best for public health. I mean, we were talking before, you have to learn about cruise ships and schools. And how do you, how do you make all these decisions on, on just this, in this complex milieu with incomplete data, how do you, how do you do that? Um, well, I have I have a lot of help. I mean, this agency is is over twenty thousand people who are working towards this, and I have an extraordinary team of subject matter experts, literally in each of these. We have a maritime unit, we have a quarantine unit, we have a schools team. So it's really I have stepped on their shoulders and learned from them in an extraordinary fashion to understand they're doing outreach with with um, with partners and to understand what the implications are for any policy that we put forward. So it may not be, or any recommendation we put forward, it may not be um, obvious as to why we may put a recommendation forward from a public health standpoint, but when you, you know, sort of see all of the other uh, issues that surround it, you, um, we really try and think through not just, um, not just where the science is, but the implications for the guidance that we have. And I'm just really um, blessed to have incredible subject matter experts in so many different areas. So Rochelle, you've been quoted as saying that we need to lead with science, which you just talked about. But we're at a stage where over the past several years, some of the trust in science has waned in the country. So how do you think about rebuilding trust in science and how is the CDC trying to work on that? Yeah, that's really important. In fact, that was one of the first things that was asked of me when um, when I was actually interviewing and saying, well, how are you going to how are you going to let the public know that science is back? So I think I have to do several things. And I have been working really hard on this one. And one big one is communication. So I have to communicate back to this incredible agency of scientists that the science is going to take precedent again. We are going to be leading exactly with the science that they produce. I want to hear what that science is. I want to hear from the subject matter experts. And I need to let them know that the scientific voice is what's going to be heard. The other thing I need to do is communicate to the public. We as an agency need to communicate to the public and to have the science, you know, convey that science to others as to why we made this decision. What was the science that is um, the decision is based upon? Um, and then I think we need to sort of rid the idea of the fact that CDC is not based in science. So one of the things that we did there is um, I'm really grateful to my principal deputy, Dr. Ann Shuket, who's, who's um, a giant in the field of public health, incredibly well respected. And I asked her before I came to review all the guidance um, from COVID um, that has been put forward and to make sure that it is written by CDC experts, it is believed by CDC experts, it is where we need to be and to really do a thorough comprehensive review of thousands of documents. Um, and through that, she, um, she really found some interesting things. Some, there were, there were three documents that were actually taken down. Um, two, two before I got here and one after I arrived. Um, there were several documents that I think our subject matter experts felt needed to be worded stronger, um, were sort of diluted a bit. And then there were several that just needed to be updated that had been um, slow to be updated. So we, um, we embarked on all of that and really have updated all of the guidance that we really wanted to move forward and taken down what we, um, what we didn't. 
Interestingly, through that process, we actually learned something about best practices. Um, so for example, um, we now have a comprehensive scientific brief that goes with every big launch of guidance. So our school guidance had, the sci uh, had our school guidance and some references, but also a 61 reference scientific brief to say this is where the science is with related, related to schools. So we've really been trying to do that outreach to key stakeholders to just make sure that um, the the messaging that we're sending is actually appropriate. Um, what is it that you need from our guidance, right? Um, because if we put out guidance and we're not actually delivering on what you need, that's not helpful. So we're doing, you know, that process I think was really helpful to make sure everybody knew, you know, this the science is back. Great. All right. Well, let's talk about the pandemic since it's on everyone's mind. And I'm going to ask you a very unfair question. So we're in, <laughs> we're, 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 we're way into our second year of the pandemic. And I know I hate to ask you to look in a crystal ball, but I'm going to ask you. So tell us what you think is going to happen here in the next several months and what's the trajectory of the pandemic going to look like? Um, so one of the key things they tell you in media training is not to project. <laughs> so... Um, but I think that they that part of the reason is because there's so much uncertainty. So let me tell you what I think could happen and where, what other things might might be stumbling blocks. Um, I am really cautiously optimistic that our case numbers are going down. We had 32,000 new infections today. That's the lowest I've seen, I think, since I started. Um, we have, you know, our our seven day average is about 52,000, also much lower than it had been for some period of time. Um, and our vaccination rate is actually, you know, making a huge amount of progress. Over 40% of people over the, eight, of the, over the age of 18 have received their second dose of vaccine or, or a J&J &J vaccine. Um, so we're making great progress, both in vaccination as well as in case rates coming down. Um, we need to do better. I'm not happy at 50,000 cases a day and 600 deaths a day. Um, so I do think we really need to do better. There are still, 40% of counties in this country that have cases of 100 per 100,000. That's really extraordinarily high. So, um, and what it's going to depend on is really how well we do as, and I wouldn't say as CDC alone, as a country in communicating to people to get vaccine. Um, because I think that is what will protect us. That is what will keep our case rates down. So part of this is the behavior of the country and, and how good we are as, at unifying and coming together to reach every single individual um, to try and send the message uh, that vaccines are safe and effective and, and our case rates will then come down even further. I think the other thing that really is an unknown is what happens with the variants. Um, we and what happens in uh, not just here, but in other countries. Um, we, you know, the WHO has said um, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, and I think that that's actually really true globally. So, um, you know, I think we have great promise into being in a much better place in, you know, weeks and months from now with high vaccine rates, lower case rates. Um, and then we really have to keep an eye on this unknown. Yeah, no, I, uh, it keeps throwing curveballs at us uh, during the whole pandemic. If we're not humble at this point, we have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we are all humble. I know, Rochelle, um, school opening has been something that you've spoken a lot about, and it's one of your priorities and things you focus on. So tell us a little bit about what your expectation is in terms of school openings this fall. Um, so February 12th, so that was about three weeks after I started, was our school opening guidance. Um, so that was a real eye opener into the world I was entering. <laughs> um, this is critical to me. I mean, I've had my kids home during the pandemic. I've seen what this has done personally. So this is really critical to me. I, I think our expectation and CDC's expectation should be that in the fall, our children are back to school full time. I have, think we have to lean into that and we have to expect that and we have to do everything that is within our power to make sure that the schools are safe in the fall. 
um, for our children to go back to school. I think our children depend on it, our mental health depends on it, our, um, our society and economy depend on it, getting women back to work, getting men back to work, um, and doing so knowing that their children are safe in school. Um, we have done a lot to make sure that that is possible, and it'll certainly help with our case rates coming down through communities. But we have demonstrated, and science has demonstrated time and time again, with the layered mitigation strategies that we have proposed, um, the mask the distancing, the hand washing, hygiene, contact tracing. Um, it's very clear that the distancing is one of the big challenges here. Um, and I do think with um, two other strategies that we now have, vaccination, um, and we've done a great job in getting our educators vaccinated, as well as serial testing. So let me just unpack that a little bit. Um, the, through the month of March, we had a sort of teacher educator vaccination uh, push um, through our federal retail pharmacy program. And in that, we've been able to vaccinate over 2 million educators um, through this program. And we now have over 80% who have received at least their first dose in the country, which I think is really great progress. The other piece is is school testing. And so what, um, what we have done, recognizing that whatever happens with vaccines, we will not by the fall have a vaccine for children 12 years and younger. And so what we've just done is put forward $10 billion in American Rescue Plan resources for serial testing programs in schools. And we're really hoping that many of these layered mitigation strategies, including vaccination and testing, will help um, alleviate the need for the space. Yeah, it's, uh, look, what you're doing here is fantastic. And it is so important for the children. We see that here with our employees and their children. Um, we need to get the kids back in school. So I think that's wonderful. So Michelle, you and I, before we came on, we're talking about some, there'll be a lot of books written about this uh, pandemic. And when you look, what do you think it's, the books are going to say about our country's response to it? And what does that mean in terms of how the country addresses other pressing healthcare issues? Um. I think we did some things extraordinarily well. We did some things not so well, and we didn't have an infrastructure ready to um, ready to address it. I really believe that. Um, let's. I think we can acknowledge nobody was ready for this. Um, I, we weren't ready for the global pandemic that this was. Um, when you look at what's happened in our public health infrastructure over the last just decade, we have been. Uh, uh, We've had the challenge of H1N1, we've had Ebola, we've had Zika, and we've had um, now COVID-19, just in the last decade. Um, and in that time, um, surveys have demonstrated that we've lost um, 56,000 public health jobs. We've lost those number of jobs just in that last decade. Um, when I've talked, I've spent some time talking to our state health officials, our state epidemiologists, many of them were receiving um, uh, uh, test results by fax. Um, so not only did we not have the workforce, we didn't have the data infrastructure to even do this. I, it was actually one very interesting conversation I recall where they said they were getting faxes and faxes and faxes. And um, because there were so many of them, they decided to enter the positives um, first because those were most important to do the contact tracing. And then we were looking at the percent positivity, not realizing that it was a completely biased sample of what they were entering. Um, we can't have data systems like that in, in our public health. Um, and then of course our state labs, right? We, we, um, when I started, I think they were doing uh, 250 genomic sequences a week. Um, how can we know what variants are out there at 250 a week? We're now up to 30,000 a week. So, you know, we just didn't have it. And we put the pedal to the metal um, over the last months to try and bolster that infrastructure. And even over the last years to try, year to try and bolster um, electronic case reporting, many other things that, that have uh, allowed us to look at the data, race and ethnicity data. Um, we simply didn't have the infrastructure to do it. And, and what you've seen time and time again is one, pan, one, one public health challenge borrows from the prior in terms of funding. There is just, it's this staccato approach to funding that has really led us to be really vulnerable in this area. So I, I really hope that um, whatever it is that we learn, we learn 
that we need a robust public health infrastructure because when you don't hear from us is when we're doing our job. During this pandemic, we have also had Ebola in DRC and we have had salmonella outbreaks and Legionnaires and a measles case and all of that works well because you haven't heard about it and we've been able to be on top of it. Maybe one other piece related to that is equity. Um, I trained at Hopkins in 1995. I was a, an intern on, on Long Cope in 1995. And, um, and you know, I learned then the challenges that this country has with equity. Um, that was the peak of AIDS um, in inner city Baltimore. And, um, and it was obvious to anybody who was on the wards then and probably still anybody who's on the wards, well, certainly now with COVID, but any time in between that diseases afflict our most vulnerable, our black, brown and black populations, they do. That's where I became so invested in this issue. Um, and, uh, you know, we are as physicians, we certainly are as infectious diseases physicians, because certainly infectious diseases impact uh, vulnerable populations more. Um, I don't think the country was or the, the world was um, the way it has impacted COVID-19, with COVID-19. So um, we had a, a paper in the MMWR, um, our vital statistics, the, the country has lost a year of life expectancy this past year, which is wow. truly extraordinary. Um, so so that, that is extraordinary in and of itself. Um, Black Americans have lost 2.7 years of life expectancy and Hispanic Americans 1.9 years of life expectancy. So if there's some other lesson I would really like, and it's not gonna be fixed in a year, it may not be entirely fixed in my tenure, but I would love to see the inflection point here that we finally do something to fix the equity challenges in health in this country. Those are amazing numbers. I mean, stunning. Yeah. Um, and I haven't seen that in the New York Times, but uh, it probably should be so that people are aware of it. Yeah, Let's it's, go back. it's uh, huge. Uh, um, you talked a little bit about the sequencing and obviously that really, uh, I think all of us are concerned with variants. I mean, it is something that, that you read about. It, it's funny when you were doing 240, our pathology lab was doing 200 a week. So, um, and so we've been following it uh, for the entire time. Um, let's talk about the variant that has taken over here in the United States, first in Europe and then in the United States, which was a B117 or people call it the UK variant. I know here in Maryland, we first sequenced it in January. Now it's 80% of our sequences here. Tell me what, how that UK variant has affected COVID here in, in the US. Um, it's really interesting. So early on when we realized it was probably around 50 to 75% increased transmissibility, um, CDC did some modeling to demonstrate, I think this was now back in January, that this was going to be the dominant variant by April. And here we are in April. And with the sequences, we can, we can map it out by region. But um, 117 is uh, 59 percent of all sequences that we are geographically distributed sequences across the country. So yes, hypertransmissible and it now has become more dominant. Um, the good news is that our vaccines work against it. And um, so perhaps that's actually good news in terms of crowding out other things, right? Because we know our vaccine works. Um, and so right now I think we're in okay shape with B117 if we are continue to vaccinate. Certainly we, the hypertransmissibility is, is not great compared to wild type. There are some studies about um, whether it's increasingly morbid or fatal. Um, and the studies um, demonstrate, yes, it is, um, although um, it's, it's an increase that is um, largely undetectable in terms of the, the survival curve. So um, if you, you certainly it's more fatal if you have a, you know, 20% fatality in a population greater than um, uh, 85. But if you take a population of, you know, 40 year olds, um, an increase in 20% mortality is really, really barely detectable in a, an extraordinarily small number. Yeah. And uh, I think we've seen the same thing here. And as I said, the, the B117 seems to be susceptible to vaccines, but some of these other variants that are here in this country, the data on, on uh, whether vaccines will prevent them or not is, is more complex. Talk yeah. a little bit about the other variants, both the ones we have here already, 
and maybe talk internationally in some of uh, the concerns we have about, uh, I'm sure that you have, about some of the um, variants that we're seeing around the world. Yeah, so we are following um, a lot of the different variants and really an interagency um, collaboration with, um, with NIH and BARDA um, and following what variants we have and, and how their, their activity is um, in the lab and, and um, in clinical trials. Um, for the mRNA vaccines and the J&J &J vaccine, um, for the variants that we know about here, the California variant, the New York variant, 526, um, 427, 427 California, 526 New York, um, and uh, you know a sparse number of B1351, that's the, the South African variant, and P1, the Brazil variant, we have every indication that our vaccines should work. Um, it is among the reasons that we re really have been so steadfast in ensuring two doses because, um, you know, we have seen in the lab that there's a, a diminution of effect in terms of uh, neutralization. And so we want to make sure you have a really good um, uh immune response with the booster to make sure that you can overcome any one of these variants. So, but with that, we believe these vaccines should be working. Um, the one that people have been talking about more recently is the 617 variant. That's the variant that um, they are seeing in India. And so uh, we are working now to understand that variant in the context of um, both the vaccine that they have there, Covaxin, as well as AstraZeneca, as well as um, the vaccines that we have here. We don't yet have um, data on that. Uh, we have some, uh, India has put out a statement that they believe the vaccines are working and we're trying to verify. Great. Well, let's talk about vaccines because that's obviously the other thing that's on everyone's mind. And, and I think uh, you quoted some statistics and I think everyone here is amazed at how quickly that we've been able to vaccinate even as many people as we have. But we're sort of at a different stage of the pandemic where the willing, most people have had access. And now we're trying to think through other populations in the US that for one reason or another, either, either accessibility or hesitancy are not vaccinated. Uh, and obviously, you also have the issue of, 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 of children. But talk about how you're thinking about, uh, let's call it vaccine hesitancy, so I know it's more complex than that. How are you thinking about getting uh, more people vaccinated in the U.S.? And what can the CDC do to, to, to help address that issue and the rest of the government too? Well, so we knew we'd get here. We always knew there was going to be a point, and in fact, we predicted late, late April, early May, where at some point we would have more supply than we did have people lining up to get it. Um, and we, we always called it the different problem, right? At first we had a too few vaccine doses and now we have more people who want, who um, we have more doses than people who want it. We knew we were gonna get here. We, de we delivered 220 million doses of vaccine in a hundred days, which I think is kind of extraordinary. Um, so here we are, right? And you know, a lot of what um, I think about when I think about vaccine hesitancy is what I learned on Osler 4. Um, when you deliver an HIV diagnosis, um, I, I was always taught you tell someone you, they have HIV and then you wait to hear what is most important to them. And you wait for a long time. And because sometimes they don't speak, but you don't know what's going through their mind. Is it, am I going to die? Did I give this to my baby? Um, where did I get this from? Who will pay for my meds? Will I lose my job? And by getting the first thing that comes out of their, their mouth, you really start to understand what is going through their mind. What is most important to them? All of those issues may be issues, but what is the most important thing? And I, I take those lessons when I think about vaccine hesitancy, because it's a huge spectrum. Um, you know, it may be that the people who were offered it first just didn't want to be first. That's fair. Um, it may be that um, they're worried about not having a day off if they feel unwell, or that it's just been too complicated or hard to get a vaccine. Um, it may be that they are worried that this went too quickly, um, that they don't really understand that mRNA vaccines have been in scientific pipelines for decades and that we were able to mobilize on this because it was. It may be they don't understand that 100,000 people were enrolled in these clinical trials or that the safety data that we have. So I think 
you know, people have talked about, well, this population doesn't want to get vaccinated and that population doesn't, if this is a one-to-one -one, and that's hard work, right? That's what we do in medicine. So I think we as an administration are working to try and overcome some of these. We've put, um, we have now 75,000 different venues that are delivering vaccine across the country. We're now give, uh, have it in trusted pharmacies. Um, we have it in 90% of people can access a vaccine within five miles of where they live. Um, that's an equity problem because not everybody can move five miles, right? So we, what do we need to do to get it to communities? So um, I think we really just need to learn the lessons that it's going, every individual is going to be um, hesitant or reluctant for a different reason. And we need to sort of meet them where they are and make sure that we have trusted messengers to giving the message. Any thoughts on how many people we could really expect to get vaccinated? Um, well, I'm an optimist. <laughs> I'm still shooting for 100%. I know we okay. won't get there, um, but I, uh, I, you know, I don't really want to have a target number. I want every single individual. And so anybody, you know, I, like I, I'm in the airport. I'll talk to the guy screening my luggage. Hey, did you get vaccinated? <laughs> um, I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Let's change topic. One of the things that we and I'm sure many others are how the pandemic has affected the healthcare workforce. You know, we were talking about clinician burnout before the pandemic hit, and we knew we had an issue both with nurses and physicians. And, you know, as we go around and, and go in the hospitals, a lot of people are have been exhausted. I mean, quite frankly, by the pandemic, it's been very hard for many people. And it's not just an issue at one institution. I when I talk to peers across the country. I think how the pandemic has affected us, you can call it burnout, but it's even more than burnout. I just think people ha have, have sacrificed um, and shown real bravery. Uh, go back to HIV days. It reminds me of that early HIV days when people were just brave. Um, and, and when you think about it, it's, probably, it's a concern we have about how this will affect long-term the workforce and healthcare. What, what's the CDC thinking about that and what, what can the CDC do to help on this? Um, I'm very worried about this. I'm worried about it also in public health um, because we will rely on this workforce. I think, um, you know, I don't have a great answer that is going to be a switch that flips to make this better because quite honestly, we still need the, the great people doing this work. Um, I do think there will be a reprieve. I do think that this will get better. It, it, it will likely only get better to its prior baseline. And so I think we as a society um, owe it to the great women and men doing this work to, to, um, to do more for them and to understand the sacrifices that they've been made, that have been made. We do have resources within NIOSH to um, start addressing this within the CDC and they are working towards that, not just CDC workforce, but how we can do it. Um, and, and we're going to, um, we're going to have to learn from one another. There's been work, I know, at numerous hospitals on, on what it is that they're doing. Um, we have never had to do this in healthcare. We have never had to say to your fellow physician, nurse, um, unit assistant, how are you today? Like, how are you really today? Um, we come in and we sort of, you know, round and flow numbers and flow sheets, but we really haven't had to do that. That's gonna be a major culture change that I think we in all of medicine are gonna have to address. You know, I, I agree. Rochelle, you've been really outspoken about the need to integrate public health and clinical care. And again, there's I've been no better demonstration of the importance of this than during this pandemic. Um, tell me, how, how are you going to break down the silos between the two? And how do you think we're going to better integrate our public health knowledge and expertise with the delivery of care in this country? You know, we're like one of the only societies that it's so siloed. It's so curious, actually, that, um, and, and I did a lot of work trying to improve this, even um, when I was uh, division chief at Mass General, I, I was on the phone with, I, with a lot of our folks in the Department of Public Health before COVID. I, I felt like there was a lot we could do in our sexual health clinic. There's just, there was so much that we could do that, that they, we needed to build these bridges. Um, I think we have seen this through our data monetization efforts. We can't um, 
you know, the, the way we are going to build public health in this, in this nation, quite honestly, I don't think is just public health and hospital systems. I think it's going to be private sector. We're going to need um, the Googles of the world to help with data information, with mobility. There's just going to be a lot that we are going to need, um, both in academic partnerships, in hospital partnerships, and in private partnerships to be able to bolster the public health infrastructure that we need in this country. Um, I can tell you that we have now um, really increased our electronic case reporting, for example. So before um, somebody would uh, uh, vaccine, a, a test result. Um, and, you know, sometimes it would have race, ethnicity data, sometimes it wouldn't. Now we have the capacity to mesh those data with Cerner and with Epic to sort of populate that information. Um, similar with, with sequence data, how are we going to understand the phenotype of a sequence if we don't can't marry the clinical outcomes with the sequence? So the, we, this is demanded of us, we have to do this in the next chapter. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the next chapter. So, you know, as we move forward um, and you're thinking, you know, I, I, you can't think beyond the pandemic, but in addition to all the work on the pandemic, you must be thinking about the future of healthcare and how the CDC is going to help lead the country moving forward. Tell me a little bit your thoughts on, on the future of healthcare and, and particularly thinking about that you're talking to Hopkins, how can academic uh, institutions like ours help uh, with the next big challenges that will face a country? So um, I've talked a bit about sort of the, the bridge to public health. Any way you are able to do that, I think would be key in terms of the public health workforce opportunities to go back and forth to, to make that a really smooth highway in discussion. Um, I've talked about equity, which I think um, we cannot as a country, and I know Hopkins is deeply uh, committed to that, as am I, um, and, and to working within the communities, to promoting people within those communities. Um, I would say one of the things that really disturbs me is areas such as hypertension control, diabetes control, um, mental health, opioid use, um, all of those areas were really challenging before 2019. And um, if anything, we've lost ground, um, especially in our um, black and brown communities, our vulnerable communities. So I really am hopeful that we can take the resources that we have gained from the American Rescue Plan, from what's happened in COVID. We've done extraordinary outreach with community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, food pantries, you know, many rural areas. Um, let's make sure that we maintain those networks so we can go back and, um, and you know, that community-based organization that got their, their folks vaccinated, let's make sure that they get their children vaccinated. So we're 11 million pediatric vaccinations behind this year. Um, and, and mostly in adolescent, much in adolescent populations, I should say. So we have a lot of work to just do the catch up work of 2020. Um, and then, you know, I really wanna focus on the mental health challenges, the opioid use. I'd like to have a really large global health footprint um, back to the no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, uh, and and um, gun injury prevention. There, there's a lot of work I feel like we, we need to do. Yeah, I mean, it's a little scary if we already have lost a year uh, on life expectation and you have delays in, in preventative care, you have delays in screening, you have delays in vaccination. Um, that doesn't portend well for the next several years in terms of, of the life expectancy in this country. I mean, I, I, I think you can have, we're gonna have a lot of issues to think through. Um, we are, and we've made extraordinary connections. Right, this is going to be about our personal connections in the communities because how we're going to gain those life expectancies is by going back and, and making sure that those people that we've met, those, those churches that did the vaccination, are we can now do blood pressure checks um, and we can do sugar control and we can do, you know, vaccinate your kids and, and mental health and, and all of those things that we're going to, we're going to need to be in the communities. That's where we're going to need to be. Yeah, that health expectancy data, you know, there already was a difference between black and brown communities and Caucasian communities. It, it's now, it looks to be another year and a half from what you described or so. And that is an issue that as a country, we're going to have to tackle and, it, you know, 
soon because it's a it's a huge problem. Uh, I think the the country will be watching, and they should be watching. We are accountable to make this better. So, Michelle, um, this is your 25th anniversary graduating from the <laughs> Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Tell us Thanks. what it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I, no, have, it's okay. it, it's, I should have just said it's a year that has a five at the end and sort of left the rest blank. I, I, my, my mistake. I apologize for that. It could be 10, five or 15, or, but, but it just happens to be 25. So um, tell us a little bit of your, your fond memories of Hopkins and of Baltimore. Um, you know, when you, I entered medical school, um, I, you know, I was a fresh college grad. Um, and the p folks who were around me were the people I studied with, the people I learned from, the people who I, um, who I went out with. Sometimes we traveled together. These were your friends, right? Um, these were your classmates. I wish I had known at the time, or maybe, maybe it's supposed to be this way, that these folks become the giants in their field. They become the people who, who you look up to. They become world-renowned figures, scientists, incredible, incredible people. Um, what a gift to um, be able to call any single one of them and say, I need a contact for or a referral for um, this kind of surgery for a loved one or that kind of um, expertise for a patient of mine. I mean, the network... Um, is truly extraordinary. And when I think about um, the fishbowl and Wood Basic Science Building, <laughs> where we would gather and read the newspaper, um, I just, I had no vision that that would be um, what became of the people in that classroom. And um, what a gift to have the network, not just at, um, in the medical school class, but in my residency class. Um, I have had extraordinary outreach from people when I was named into this position. Um, I uh, take with me every day uh, the word equanimitas, the um, imperturbability, uh, cheerfulness, and, and unflappable uh, traits that were taught to me in uh, 19, in the mid 1990s. And, um, you know, I, I'm still a work in progress. But I realized, that, you know, the, the, as I learned those traits, um, how critical they would be for my entire career and how well ingrained they were um, during that period of time. So I really, um, I just feel like my time at Hopkins was such a gift, um, so well prepared me for the future and left me with this huge network of really dear friends and, and medical family. So Rochelle, do you have any special messages for your classmates that we can show to them at on reunion? <laughs> Well, I've seen a lot of them on Zoom. I mean, it's been a small gift of this pandemic. Um, happy, healthy 25th. We'll see you at the 50th. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably good. So, Michelle, I have one last. What keeps you up at night? What is it that you that you go you, wakes you up and say, I, I, "This is what, what's going to my biggest concern right now." Um. On any given night, it could, I mean, it's the public health challenges of the future is, are we going to have the resources to make sure that this country is safe? And then are we gonna have the resources to make sure that the rest of the world is safe? Um, so, you know, immediately, uh, you know, if you look at sort of the thing most in front of me right now is, can we vaccinate enough people here locally um, to make sure that we don't have another surge and that we don't have a variant that takes over? And at the same time, um, can we do so by remaining responsible citizens of this world and making sure the rest of the world is taken care of? Well, I will say that when I think of the term equiminitas, uh, Rochelle, I think in your time at CDC, you've demonstrated that uh, a time and time again. And so we are so proud of you. Uh, and on behalf of the um, Johns Hopkins and really the country, uh, we are so fortunate to have you uh, leading these efforts and leading the Biden administration's response to the pandemic. Um, so on behalf of all of us, thank you for what you're doing. Um, this series is a quarterly event joined uh, by the Schools of Public Health, Nursing, Business, and Johns Hopkins Medicine. Um, I hope all of you can join us again. Uh, I, I, Rochelle, uh, we had Tony Fauci the first time. I don't know how anyone's going to follow you and Tony, but I assume <laughs> someone 
we'll be able to do that uh, in the future. So um, again, on behalf of Hopkins and, and, and the country, Rochelle, thank you for what you're doing and thank you for joining us today uh, for this talk. And thank you so much to my Hopkins friends and family. Thank you.